case. What are the symptoms of a sting from this creature? Well, you basically, uh, you kind of, it's burning and pain and numbness, and uh, you can feel kind of uh, generally bad. But most of the people who get a sting from these things have no problems. There's between 11 and 17,000 stings of this from these scorpions a year. And how many deaths? Since 1968, there have been two deaths. Two. So the idea is that it's kind of an annoyance. It's, a, it's one of the problems for living in Arizona. This is the guy that it causes most of the trouble. He's a, um, called a bark scorpion. And uh, he is one of the only guys that can climb a tree. That's why they call him the bark scorpion. He's also the color of bark. And this lady has all her babies uh, on top there, as you can see. Look at that little thing there. Uh, Lights Out Exterminating Company is about to go after this. Uh, this. Um, I thought there was a kind of neat, uh, neat um, little case about this. So we had two deaths a year. Um, oh, yeah. So this, this was a woman in Chandler, Arizona. Um, these guys are primarily active at night. And when it's nice and warm, uh, they have the ability, if you notice the uh, tail on this thing, usually you think of a scorpion's tail as kind of being up in the center. This guy's tail is laying down flat. They know how to do that. And even the little babies lay down flat, which allows them to get between uh, narrow things. So this lady was reaching in a box of filters for her, the air conditioner, and she got stung by this thing. And uh, this lady went to Chandler Hospital, I believe it was, and... Um, she was there for three hours and was sent home. She was given two amps of uh, anti-venom because she had some systemic symptoms rather than just local symptoms. And um, uh, she did fine. And uh, she, uh, her insurance company paid um, $57,000 for her three-hour visit to the emergency department. And, um, and that, wasn't, that wasn't all that bad, I guess. Uh, <laughs> She, however, got a bill for the remainder of the, because that's only what her insurance company paid. Her bill was $25,000. The total bill by this, and this was all in the papers and all over the place, was $82,000 for a scorpion sting with two amps of uh, antivenom. And uh, antivenom is made in Mexico, costs $100. They bring it into the United States, costs $3,500 in the United States. So they gave her two, which was $7,000, and obviously there was a little markup uh, in this case. Um, and uh, this is kind of consistent with all of this stuff you see about ER bills. Uh, did I tell you about the AARP when I got in my little newspaper in the AARP in the, uh, fifth, in the $24,000 aquasprain? Did I tell you about that? Well, I wrote about it uh, recently. Uh, basically, uh, for some reason, some, I have no idea wh why I would qualify. I got the AARP bulletin. <laughs> and um, on, the, on the cover of this thing, I got it two days ago, was um, ER bill, ankle sprain, $54,000. I said, oh, here we go again, you know? Uh, same kind of thing. I turned it op open to uh, the story that they, um, they quoted an article that was published uh, from UC San Francisco where they looked at this uh, national database of the 10 most common uh, ER visits, and they looked at the, uh, the lowest price and the highest price and the median price and, uh, of the 10 visits. And they had things like there were like kidney stones and UTIs and, and URIs and things like that. And um, the whole point of the article was uh, the uh, huge discrepancy in the prices, like a kidney stone. One, one guy got treated for a kidney stone for $128. The uh, median price, half above, half below, is $3,000. But one person's charge for a kidney stone was $34,000. And, the, and these are all discharged patients, and they only had one diagnosis when they left, kidney stone. Um, and so uh, the whole point was that the prices are all over the dartboard, and there's no rationale for any of this stuff. And did you see yesterday in the news that the government's going to release all of this uh, huge database on hospital charges, did you see that? Well, that's going to come out and show the same, same ridiculousnessnessnessness. Uh, we got this guy on number six here, 47-year-old um, on-duty nurse presents to the ED after, uh, after another nurse said, "Hey, you know your pupils dilated there." Um, 
Didn't feel at all sick or anything like that. No headache, nausea, history like that. We, we usually kind of freak out when people have dilated pupils like that. How can you tell which of the pupils is abnormal? Maybe the other ones are abnormal. The other one's too small. Well, basically, if you shine a light in the big pupil and it doesn't contract, then that's the problem. And if you put this person in a dark room and the small one doesn't get bigger, that's the uh, problem. Uh, what additional questions regarding history are appropriate in this person? Anybody? Get the cause of this problem? What caused this person's problem? Anybody? Yes. What did they do? Scopolamine patch. They were putting a scopolamine patch on a patient and then rub their eye, and that would cause this problem. There's another cause for the same problem, though, which I, which I, I saw this case. This, this is not my patient, but I saw this case. And I also saw the other version of this case, which is, um, came down with a unilateral pupil. Uh, what other medicine that you know could cause a unilateral dilated pupil? And in fact, Diane basically showed you how you squirt your MDI any place but your uh, mouth. Because these are adrenergics, and then you put, and it's been shown that asthmatics have large, uh, tend to have uh, uh, unequal pupils, largely because of they, they're squirting this stuff all over the place, and a lot of places people don't do it well, and it gets in their eyes. So there's the two causes: is an adrenergic or an atropine-like drug are the two causes for. So this person is perfectly well otherwise, and um, but normally we think, oh, this is a brain tumor. This is a bad kind of thing. Um, let's move on to number seven. I like this one. This is a kind of a fun one. So this is an 85-year-old lady presented uh, with a right arm twitching. She had a history of Alzheimer's disease and a, was in a, in a skilled nursing home at breakfast. The nurse, nursing staff noticed this rhythmic twitching of her uh, arm. She had a pacemaker implanted for six sinus syndrome two months ago before her visit. No problem with that. No complaints. She's uh, denied any problems related to her pacemaker. An EKG showed normal sinus rhythm without any pacing activity. What may be causing this patient's problem? Anybody? How do you know that? How do you know that? And what you call the... Twiddler. That's right. It's called a twi twiddler syndrome. Because if you notice in the picture, the, uh, the two leads are um, way out of the heart, you know, way out of the heart up there. And so that as, as, the, as this, these demented people, they have got this pacemaker, and they just spin it around, and they just spin it around. It's like reeling up their fishing line from, the, uh, from inside their heart there kind of thing. And that's what, that's what happened here. And that's a, that it is what it's called, the Twiddler syndrome. So they basically wind up having to push this thing back down and put the pacemaker either under the pectoralis muscle or do something. But the twitching of the arm, in fa fact, you can twitch all kinds of things as this thing is being wheeled out by this, uh, by this patient. So that was just a kind of a, a, a fun one. Um, number eight is a little bit more serious. What do you think, uh, what do you think that picture looks like? Looks like pulmonary edema, doesn't it? What's atypical about this picture of pulmonary edema? Small heart, exactly. So this is one of these cases of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Or, you know, you could get this in the setting of an MI, basically, with a sudden uh, cardiac dysfunction, but the heart's not going to have a chance to dilate out. But this is a case of a 51-year-old man, so, um, karaoke. Uh, he dropped dead singing karaoke. I think it's one of the reasons here that you probably, or no, he collapsed. Why you ought not sing karaoke. Um, on arrival at the emergency department, he had a glass of coma score of four, not doing well, with symmetrical and reactive pupils, a blood pressure of 149 over 104, pulse of 105. Respiratory rate was uh, elevated at 26. Uh, O2 sat was a little on the low side at 91. Respiratory status then further deteriorated, pink frothy sputum was suctioned from the endotracheal tube, O2 sat went down, and chest x-ray was obtained. The likely, what is the likelihood that this patient will have a normal brain scan? Zero. Uh, what is the likelihood that this patient will need a lumbar puncture? Zero. What is the diagnosis on the chest x-ray? You got that, it's a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And uh, what is the cause of this? This is the result of this, this huge adrenergic surge 
that comes out in the setting of this catastrophe that this person has had, resulting in um, diffuse vasoconstriction and pulmonary capillary leak. So basically, the pulmonary capillaries are leaking, causing um, the space between the alveoli and the blood vessels to be filled up with this fluid. And, and so they're, they're, the exchange of oxygen is going to be more problematic as this as the fluid accumulates there. The lungs become heavier. The oxygenation goes down. The work of breathing goes up. So it becomes a, becomes a spiral of increasing activity in terms of lung breathing, but, it, but which needs oxygen, but you're getting less oxygen kind of thing. So um, in, in these cases, uh, would we be giving Lasix for this? No, this is not a fluid overload problem. This is a capillary leak problem. So we would try to support uh, um, oxygenation as best we could by basically kind of um, giving supplemental oxygen. Um, what about passive hypercapnia in this? Would this be a good case for passive hypercapnia where we basically don't want to, um, where we're willing to allow the CO2 to rise so that we don't have to use a lot of positive pressure to ventilate these patients? Um, not probably a good idea because of it, hypercapnia is basically going to increase intracranial pressure again. So this is a delicate balance here of oxygenation first. Uh, and um, but not sacrificing you know, PCO2. They also say that these, this may be a transient phenomena as this kind of this um, sympathetic discharge kind of declines over time. It is not a very good marker of survival, however, but um, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Um, number nine, 28-year-old woman uh, on uh, this... Enbril, you've heard of that, for rheumatoid arthritis. That's kind of the new thing now, is to give early on in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis drugs that are specific anti-inflammatories that are focused on joints. It's not across the board in anti-inflammatory. It's just kind of more focused on, somehow they get it to kind of focus on the joints, but it's, but it's not like it's solely on that. And uh, she's got this rash for four days, and one day of a fever, Rash began on the trunk and progressed to cover her body. Intense itching. She had a little sore throat, inability to tolerate all her oral fluids as well, mild cough, vital signs. She had a fever. Blood pressure was okay. Pulse was elevated substantially. Respiratory rate, um, 12 to 22, so it was going up. Oxygen sat was okay, um, but not totally normal. Except for the rash and abnormal vitals, her physical exam is normal. White count is also normal. So anybody want to think what that rash is? Um, Varicella, right. And one of the characteristics of this is, is um, most rashes, when they come, they kind of come all, all come at one time and then all leave at one time. But varicella is the, the characteristically, they call it the, uh, do, uh, the, uh, the dew drop on the rose petal. So it's, it's, it's a clear, blistery kind of thing on, on the erythema. But the characteristic of this begins in the central part of the trunk is that the lesions are of different ages. So some of these are brand new, like a little blister. Some of them are healing. Some of them are scabbing over kind of thing is one of the characteristics of, of this. Now, uh, this, the significance of embryo here is that it is a immunosuppressive. So uh, it's used in psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, Rheumatoid arthritis, the reason they give this early on is to stop the destruction of the joint. This stuff will do it. So it's not just about um, you know, symptomatic treatment. This, and so the uh, theory here is as soon as you see somebody with rheumatoid arthritis, they get onto these drugs to stop the progression, which can be demonstrated over time by taking uh, x-rays of the joints. Uh, she actually also had a little... Um, Pneumonitis when they took an X-ray of her chest, basically because um, this is this is a virus basically which is causing this rash, but it also uh, can cause uh, pneumonitis in patients who are immunosuppressed. So this would be a, a nice candidate for uh, giving IV what a cyclovir or one of its cousins. Uh, um, um, what's number ten? We've all seen this, you know, it's like it's freaky kind of thing. You see this thing, and they come in and say, what is this kind of thing? And then you have to go to the books and say, all of the diseases that are associated uh, with um, erythema <laughs> nodosum, 
which is basically an inflammation of the subcutaneous fat. Um, why? Who knows? Um, hey, it's one of these complex disorders. HLA, uh, uh, B27, all, uh, these non, it, it's associated with drugs, it's associated with uh, these uh, arthropathies. Um, but, but it's an easy pickup for us. And then you go to the books and find out, try and find out, well, what is the a disease that has precipitated this? Uh, number 11, what is, what is number 11? Perichondritis, so that's, that's, that's cool. Um, and um, so this is an infection of, of not the skin and it's not the cartilage, it's the membrane between the two. If you move the ear around, that's gonna be painful. It's red and warm. Uh, where do you think this thing uh, came from? You can see actually, she's got a pierced ear or he has a pierced ear, but it's not red down there. Um, and why isn't it red down where the piercing is? Because there's no cartilage down there. And you know, no cartilage, you're not going to get this perichondritis. So the, the trigger to this actually is if you look at the top of the ear, there's a couple little holes there where they had, if you pierce through the cartilage part of the ear, you're much more prone to get this than if you pierce through the non-cartilage part of the ear. So this is, and uh, what antibiotic would you use to treat this? This is a very clear. It's not a strep. It's not a staph. This is, this is pseudomonas, 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 pseudomonas. And it, it is the same etiology of external otitis. External otitis is pseudomonas. And so we, oftentimes we give the eardrops and the um, antibiotic eardrops and the cortisporin and things like that for uh, external otitis. But sometimes it's kind of bad and you want to give a, a, an oral antibiotic as well. And we tend to think, well, oh, skin infection, ah, here's some Keflex for that. Well, that would be the wrong choice in this case. This is um, consistently, number one is pseudomonas. Yes, number two and three might be staph and strep, but they are down, down the list. So the, you know, the, now, now they have these Cipro eardrops, and, and, that, and that's the, the thrust of that, is that the uh, flor, fluoroquinolones are very good for staph and strep, okay, but they're really good for pseudomonas. So... Um, External otitis now can be treated with uh, those. The problem is it's extraordinarily expensive. It's like 40 bucks for uh, the Cipro eardrops, at least in this country. So um, pseudomonas is the key here. You want to give a little um, Cipro for that, that'd be fine. Um, I think we covered uh, number... All right, 20, uh, number 12, 80-year-old male presents the ED with a pain in the back of his ankle with difficulty walking. The onset began somewhat suddenly two days ago. He's having significant difficulty climbing <laughs> stairs. He's been in remarkably good health, but was treated for bronchitis about a month ago. His physical exam is otherwise normal. What's the diagnosis? So he's ruptured his uh, Achilles tendon here. Yes, he did. And um, what imaging studies are appropriate? Well, actually, uh, according, to, to, according to the paper that's in your manual, uh, do you see the, the paper there? Somebody said an MRI. He said nothing. No, actually, they say this, there's a dent there that is palpable. The foot doesn't go up and down. As a matter of fact, there's a study here where they, where is, let me get you the study. 66 patients. Uh, uh, let me get you the study here. Well, anyway, MRI is unnecessary for diagnosing a, uh, this disorder. Uh, they had 66 patients that were clinically examined and 66 patients who had MRI, and all 132 had all, all three clinical criteria. The three clinical criteria are you squeeze the calf. When you squeeze the calf, the foot's supposed to go down. It didn't go down. When you move the ankle compared to each other, there was more tension on the ankle that was normal compared to the one that had the ruptured tendon, and the third thing was a palpable defect. So this is a, a, a clinical diagnosis. Uh, can you speculate what caused the patient's problem? So he got, he got yeah, Leviquin, 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 Leviquin. And what else did he get? He got a little bronchitis kind of thing. Throw in a little steroids. Steroids is, is a known um, magnifier of this problem for sure. Um, and um, this is not a, this is, this is, a, a kind of a serious issue. 
It's been black box. It was black box in 2008. Um, after a successful lawsuit, it was only black boxed after a one of these consumer groups basically sued the FDA and said, you need to black box this thing. Um, because the literature on it was so clear cut that it was a problem and the FDA was just dragging its feet. Um, now, if you prescribe any of the fluoroquinolones, the pharmacist, I don't know if you know this, is mandated to give the patient a fact sheet about the risk of these, um, these uh, tendon-related uh, problems. Uh, it's, it's, and all of the elements on the fact sheet are specified by the FDA. Uh, in um, 2011, another black box was put on this for neuromuscular blocking activity associated with myasthenia gravis. The first lawsuit uh, involved an 82-year-old guy, John Shedden, who um, five years previously was put on Leviquin, you got it, and steroids for his bronchitis. He ruptured both Achilles tendons within three months. The effect of this antibiotic, you can give it for a short two, three, four, or five days. It's been shown six months later, they have, still have an increased risk of a tendon rupture. It is la whatever it does, it is lasts at least that long. The odds ratio for a rupture at six months is 1.4. So um, he ruptured both of his tendons within three months. On December 8, 2010, he was awarded $1.8 million. 1.1 of it was punitive damages because it was believed that McNeil Laboratories, who was making this stuff, inadequately warned doctors of this, con of this problem. And um, so they black boxed it in 2008. This, he, the, his rupture occurred five years before 2010. And um, the problem with this is, um, when you give this antibiotic, it's, the risk is greater the older the patient is, <clears throat> particularly patients over 80. Uh, the, the, it's dose-related, and it is related to which fluoroquinolone you give. Some of them are much worse than others, although it is a class effect. The safest is Cipro. The worst is, uh, which, uh, uh, is ofloxacin. Ofloxacin has a 28 times greater risk of these ruptures occurring than does Cipro, so you, that's one you want to stay away from. Um, so it's dose, age, and, and, and drug related in terms of which one you pick. Uh, but now the issue is that black box is, on, um, is in the PDR, and you all know about it because they sent everybody a, a letter about this. Uh, there are over, at the time of this lawsuit, there was over 1,500 lawsuits pending re related to uh, tendon injuries in the United States. Uh, this was the one that said, okay, let's, let's run the others now. We got to, the, the first one worked. So this was the, um, whatever they call the precedent-setting lawsuit. The problem now is, is that when you prescribe this stuff, um, and if there's a problem later in terms of a tendon injury that up to maybe six months later, they're going to say, doctor, um, was there some other antibiotic that you could have used to treat this person's bladder infection or their bronchitis or whatever you used for it? And the answer is going to be, of course, there was. First of all, I may not have needed any antibiotic. And second of all, this is black boxed. And so why didn't you? What about amoxicillin or something else or Bactrim or something like that? And I think it's going to be tough because um, you're going to be in a bad position. It's going to be like, well, uh, yeah, I probably could have used something else. Now look at this poor guy. He's got this tendon rupture. And, uh, he and this guy, after his, after his surgery, did not do well. It's not like you go back to normal necessarily uh, after you try to put these things back together again. So I think basically the idea here is you've got to be a little, a little careful with this. Yes, it not, doesn't happen all the time for sure, but it's avoidable 100% of the time by picking some other antibiotic. Uh, um, and if you're going to use it, use it for something very specific. And the things that we know are, that are specific for uh, yeah, you got pneumonia. Well, m maybe we'll use some Leviquin pneumonia. We could also use azith azithromycin for pneumonia just as easily, and you only need to take it like once a day kind of thing. Um, so there are other choices, even with uh, disorders like that. And certainly, you know, for the ear thing, it is probably the drug of choice. And when you get that rare infection through the, uh, the you know, when you step on a nail, 
the first infection that you're going to get when you step on a nail is going to be a staph infection. It is not going to be the famous Pseudomonas osteomyelitis. That's going to be down the road. That's going to be weeks later after you step on the nail. So the idea, and some people have even thought that it's appropriate to put people on prophylactic uh, fluoroquinolones for, for nails through, this, through a sneaker. There's no evidence that that would work at all, and it's certainly not the standard of care. So I, I guess we're, what I'm suggesting is be a little bit careful about this because there are alternatives that you can use. Well, I can't get I can't tell you that specifically, but in in a couple in the reviews that are included in your thing there, um, mm, mm, uh, it does say it's dose related, but it doesn't get into the specifics. But it does get into like the odds ratio for ofloxacillin versus cipro. Cipro is three and a half times greater. Ofloxacillin was twenty eight times greater. Um, and there is definitely, it takes off when, when you get into your, into your 80s. The, it's much, much greater uh, then. Um, the, uh, and they also talk about the odds ratio in terms of the frequency. Uh, 4.3 was the odds ratio when you were on it today, the drug today. It was 2.4 when you were within six months, and 1.4 beyond six months. So I, I misstated that a little bit. 2.4 within six months, beyond six months, 1.4. So it's got this long, long, long acne effect. Okay.